All right, welcome back to the fourth part of this rather long lecture about internal variability of the climate system. Um, the truth is, this could go on for a semester. I mean, there's just a lot of sources of internal variability. In fact, it would actually be a really interesting course. In fact, it would be a really interesting career to spend your time studying the ways in which internal variability of the climate system and external or forced climate variability, to use the right terminology, uh, interact. But we can't do that, okay? We just don't have time in a course like this. And so I just want to talk about one other interesting example of a source of internal variability in the climate system, and that is the so-called quasi-biennial oscillation. Now again, this is a phenomenon that is usually covered in a course like tropical meteorology or tropical climatology, and if we teach that course again, and I'd love to, um, you know, we spend actually several days on this particular subject. It's a key idea in a lot of aspects of what goes on in the tropics, but it is also a good example of the internal variability of the climate system, and let's kind of pick it apart. By the way, almost nobody uses the word quasi-biennial oscillation because it's hard to say. QBO tends to be the word we use for this phenomenon. Now, the quasi-biennial oscillation, or the QBO, is a phenomenon that you primarily look for in the stratosphere. Now, right off the bat, that should strike you as a strange thing. We almost never get bogged down about stratospheric things, either in like a meteorology class or a climate class, because frankly, the stratosphere is pretty darn high. It's the layer of the atmosphere above the troposphere, above the tropopause, starting at about maybe 11 or 12 kilometers above the surface of the Earth and extending up to a height of about 50 kilometers. And other than the ozone layer, which is a certainly an important climate and meteorology phenomenon, environmental pro problem, etc., uh, other than that, there's not a lot going on in the stratosphere in general that we get all that excited about. But, but there's a key exception, and that is the QBO. And if I had to come up with a set of words to just describe the QBO real quick as we start looking at some figures and so on, I'd say that the QBO is an oscillation in the east-west component of the wind in the stratosphere. The, you know, the wind has, you know, it's a vector and we could divide it up into the east-west component of the wind and the north-south component of the wind. As it happens, the east-west component of the wind has an oscillation to it. In fact, I can show you some examples of that. Here is, oh, I don't know, about 20 years of data that comes from the uh, Climate Diagnostics Bulletin. And let me just back this up here. And um, this is, uh, I have a couple slides that are problematic here, so I'm going to work on this a little bit before you guys see it. Um, here's a graph that shows the average east-west component of the wind, where a term that's, from the, that's positive means the wind is from the west, and a term that is negative is from the east. And this is averaged all the way around the world. It's a zonal average, like we learned about in like the third module and so on, all around the world in the tropics, I don't know, from 20 north to 20 south or something like that. So they we're talking about a huge chunk of the world, like a third of the area of the world. Look what's going on, say, with that red curve there. See how the curve went negative, and then positive, and then negative, and then positive, and so on? In meteorology, we call that an oscillation. And so there is an oscillation to, if you look at the key there, that's the 30 hectopascal zonal wind. A hectopascal is the same as a millibar. 30 millibars is pretty high up in the stratosphere. I mean, maybe 25, 30 kilometers above the ground, something like that. And so over a huge chunk of the stratosphere, you know, like I said, this is zonally average, average all the way around the world and from like 20 north to 20 south or something. We have winds that are from the west. I'm sorry, for, well, if we just use this graph here, starting winds from the east, winds from the west, winds from the east, winds from the west. And this is not a small thing. I mean, look, the difference between the positives and the negatives are about, you know, there's a span of about 40 meters per second. I mean, this is a huge... The winds are fast from the east and then the winds are fast from the west and so on. This is a really interesting phenomenon. It has a period of about 26 months, which is weird. 26 months. A period, as in like from one peak to the next peak. So one full cycle of the quasi-binding oscillation is about 26 months, which is not a multiple of the annual cycle. It's not a multiple of the seasonal cycle. What in the world is this dumb thing? Okay? Well, there's actually some important hints here that, again, somebody who had taken like fluid mechanics courses or something would, would start seeing some hints of. For example, if you look at this diagram here, the red curve was for 30 millibars, but the, fifth, uh, the blue curve is for 50 millibars, which is quite a bit closer to the ground. 
And if you notice, the two curves are similar but not the same. In fact, we get to the peak of the, like the westerly winds on the red curve before we get to the peak of the curve on the, on the blue curve. So like we have 20 years of data here, and we always get to the peak, the strongest west winds at 30 millibars before we get them cl closer to the ground. In other words, these are features that are propagating downward with respect to time. Now that's an important hint, again, for somebody who's had like fluid mechanics. Once you start seeing these kinds of features that are all the way around a spinning, uh, they're in a fluid, all the way around a globe, at the equator, there's, there's, the math starts becoming clear. These are going to be what are called Kelvin waves. Okay, we're not going to get bogged down as to what a Kelvin wave is or anything like that. This is not a fluid mechanics course. But this is a thing. Atmospheric scientists know to look for things like this. and We know a little bit about them. For example, I'm going to show you this animation here. All right, so this is like a cross-section of the atmosphere for some place in the tropics or whatever. And the bottom part of this diagram here is the troposphere. You know, the part of the atmosphere where we live, where almost all the weather happens, etc. And then we hit the tropopause at about 11 kilometers up. And from there on up, we hit the stratosphere. And notice how I have this animated here. We're going to have sequences of winds from the east winds from the west, winds from the east, winds from the west. And I mean, this is way, way sped up here. Remember, from one peak of easterly winds to the next peak of easterly winds at any given altitude is going to be like 26 months. Okay, so this is a long period of time. But notice how these phenomena are slowly propagating downward. That is, again, uh, for somebody who's had like a fluid mechanics course or something like that, that's a dead giveaway that these are Kelvin waves in the stratosphere. This is a known thing, okay? Oh, weird. Weird, weird. They're generated by storm systems in the troposphere, and then the energy propagates upward into the stratosphere, creates these oscillations, and it propagates downward. There's all kinds of fascinating phenomena. I like this visualization of them, too. Um, in this visualization, we're looking, like, above the North Pole here. Okay, so we're looking down on the globe. The red circles there, that is... Let me make sure I got this right. That is a wind out of the east. The green circles are winds out of the west. And you can see how what this Kelvin wave, this quasi-biennial oscillation is, is it's these slowly contracting rings of air uh, propagating around the world. You can see how like there's this red ring of air propagating from east to west and gradually contracting as it gets down and down through the stratosphere and gets close to the tropopause. And then at some point it dissipates and a new ring of easterly momentum and easterly winds forms up above it, and you just get these contracting rings of uh, flow. Um, again, it looks alien. Okay, I get it that without a, a background in fluid mechanics, you probably have never seen fluid simulated behaving this way and so on. But it's kind of a, it's a thing if you've had fluid mechanics or if you've had tropical meteorology or something like that. You've seen phenomena like this before. In this You'll be forgiven for thinking this is strange and hard to imagine that we would have such a thing and such a space-age looking thing. We, we probably just only recently discovered it, but quite to the contrary, the QBO was actually originally discovered in like the 40s. Um, the 40s and the 50s was sort of the heyday of, of figuring out what this whole thing was about uh, because that was the era in which we did a lot of studies of the stratosphere, not because we cared all that much about the stratosphere itself, but because that was where we could detect the radioisotopes that told us that like the Soviets were testing H-bombs and things like that. And so we needed to understand what the stratosphere was doing so that we could have that particular application more than we actually, in a general sense, care that much about the stratosphere itself. But it's really only in recent decades that we've come to understand that there, this is an important source of internal variability for the climate system overall. It's part of the story why one year's weather is different from another year's weather. Why we have dry summers versus wet summers, or summers with unusually active hurricane seasons and summers with unusually quiet hurricane seasons. In fact, the phase of the quasi-biennial oscillation, whether we are in the easterly phase or whether we're in the westerly phase of it, near the tropopause, is actually one of the main factors that determines how active an Atlantic hurricane season is. It's part of how they produce those long-range forecasts of the uh, hurricane, you know, where they say 2,000, you know, whatever is going to be an unusually active hurricane season. This is where that information comes from. Well, part of it anyway, and it's also related to other sources of internal variability like El Nino and so on. So this is an important, and it certainly has been tied to other things, uh, short-term droughts and things like that. It's an important source 
of climate variability. It's an internal source. It's purely about the mechanics of how a fluid moves on a uh, rotating sphere in statically stable conditions. I mean, there's a very specific set of conditions that makes these oscillations, but they're present in the tropical stratosphere. Oh. Well, now, since we know that this has climate implications, obviously, we would want to know how this could be changed or forced by the forced kinds of climate variations, like greenhouse gases or anthropogenic aerosols or something like that. And that gets complicated fast. I mean, as the IPCC report states, it has been unclear how the QBO will respond to future climate change related to greenhouse gases increase and the recovery of stratospheric ozone. Ozone is part of the story about why the QBO is such a stable phenomenon and so on. Well, we are recovering the stratospheric ozone. How will that change? Uh, climate models assessed in the AR4, remember we're reading the AR5, the fifth assessment report, the previous one before this, which was about, I don't know, about six or seven years earlier. The previous models assessed in the AR4 did not simulate the QBO as they lacked the necessary vertical resolution. In other words, the numerical models they were using at that time, you know, now getting to be like 10, 15 years ago, simply couldn't make a realistic looking quasi biennial oscillation into the future. And as a consequence, we had no tool to figure out how it was changing and how it was related to things like changes in global mean temperature or changes in the ozone concentration or whatever. Oh, that's a real problem. And so the, 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 key, the, um, the AR5 takes a rather unbold, what's a timid response of saying, on the basis of the recent literature, where now we can simulate the QBO better, is uncertain how the period or the amplitude of the QBO may change in the future, and confidence in the projections remains low. What they're trying to say here is that this is an important source of internal variability of the climate system. It's a big deal because it controls things like how productive the Atlantic is at making hurricanes and other climate phenomena. And yet, we have no real understanding as of the present time as to how it could change in a world with anthropogenic climate effects. Um, that's kind of sucks. I mean, the public could care less, and policymakers could care less about the QBO itself, but you start telling them that this could be about changes in Atlantic hurricane tropical cyclone genesis, um, yes, they care very much, or short-term droughts or things like that. They suddenly care very much, but we actually have very low confidence as to how those are changing. In practice, what happens, actually, if you read the AR5 more closely, you'll see some models are telling us that the it'll get stronger, some tell us it'll get weaker, etc. We are able to simulate a QBO, but they're not presenting a, the many different models that they used in these ensembles did not produce a consistent idea as to what the how the QBO will change. Rats. Here's an important thing about climate system, and we can't seem to get a hold of it. And in that regard, the quasi-biennial oscillation is alarmingly typical of what we know about our state-of-the-art understanding of these sources of internal climate variability. I mean, climate studies quickly went, researchers in the climate sciences quickly went after things like El Nino. And we kind of developed some understanding of what's going on in El Nino in the few, next hundred years or something like that. But the truth of the matter is a lot of these climate sources of climate variation, like the Madden, like uh, QBO and other ones, I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time on Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and the Pacific decadal oscillation, and there's a whole table of these things in the AR5. And the truth of the matter is most of them we don't yet know enough about how they will change. They probably will have some kind of change. There are already, all of these things are important sources of year-to-year -year variability in climate as to like why one winter is unusually severe and another is unusually mild. And most of them, in general, we just don't know. We just don't know how they're going to change. It's not that they're not going to change, it's that we have no information. Either the models yet don't reproduce that variability very well, or they reproduce the variability, but within the ensemble of 40-some-odd global climate models, we're getting a wide range of, of different answers as to how these sources of internal variability are going to change. That's not a very science, not a very science, not scientific, that's not a very satisfying answer. It would be great if we could say, oh my goodness, the, um, the zonal index, that's another uh, source of climate variability. Um, it's part of what's related to, like, the, you've heard of uh, the polar vortex, for example, as to why, like, some winters are so severe. Well, it would, almost certainly there will be some change to the zonal index as a consequence of global warming, but we still don't actually know what it is. 
Um, the public would really like to know that, and unfortunately, that's the kind of answers we're not ready to give yet. We don't have a consistent answer to that. Rats. Okay, this has been a really long lecture. Let's answer a couple quick questions before we're finally done. Um, question 10. The quasi-biannual oscillation is a source of blank variability, forced or internal. Hey, I want to spend a second here. It occurs to me I didn't actually tell you the word quasi-biennial. That means almost two years. Okay? 26 months is the period of the oscillation. So quasi-biennial oscillation means almost two years or approximately two years. Is it a forced or an internal source of your climate variability? Make a choice from those two options and get a little feedback before you move on to question 11.